introduction to this talk, I want to read a short passage of an exchange that a man had with a Buddha that um, didn't work out very well, or at least for the man who asked the question. So there's this man named Dandapani who was out uh, walking and wandering for exercise, and he came to where the Buddha was. And so he went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side, leaning on his stick, and asked the Blessed One, what does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? So what do he has asking the Buddha, what do you assert? What do you proclaim? And the Buddha replied, friend, I assert and proclaim in such a way that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world. I assert and proclaim what he has to teach, such a way that it doesn't enter, it doesn't dispute or disagree with anybody at all. And so when, when this uh, Danda, Dandapani heard this, he shook his head, wagged his th tongue, and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered in three lines. <laughs> then, he, then he departed, leaning on his stick. <laughs> so, you know, we have all these stories of the Buddha saying these wonderful things to people, and they get enlightened or something wonderful happens. And I uh, hear the man just was confused. So what he was confused at was the Buddha saying, I teach in such a way that I'm never in dispute with anyone. Don't quarrel with anyone. So then the question is, what kind of teachings can one assert? What kind of teachings can one hold on to that doesn't cause controversy with someone else? We live in an amazingly religiously pluralistic society with all kinds of different religious and atheistic beliefs. And it's a seem that uh, if you assert that you're Buddhist or you adhere to Buddhist teachings or you proclaim Buddhism, that on the surface it would seem like that's a different religious teaching from other religious teachings. And so you are asserting one thing to be true, and if that is true, then it certainly must be the other ones are not true. In the time of the Buddha, it was also religiously pluralistic. There were a lot of different religious views in his environment. And in fact, there was a lot of debate between the different spiritual teachers of his time. So the idea of disputing and debating and asserting and proclaiming in opposition to other people uh, was a, quite a common phenomena for the Buddha and his time. And so the Buddha comes forth and says, I don't do that. I had my teachings and my teachings don't oppose anything. And there's no grounds for quarreling with anyone, any, any views, any teachings with people because of how would I assert. So that's the introduction. So what, what can you teach? How, what, what, what is it about Buddhism that maybe is not in opposition to other religious, other points of view? If you take a, a college class, Introduction to World Religions, They'll do a survey of different religions, and Buddhism is offered as a religion, just like all the other religions, Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, uh, Islam. Sometimes they have Shintoism, Confucianism, and then Buddhism. And especially coming from the West, there's a, such a strong feeling in the Judeo-Christian tradition, especially Christian traditions, that um, you have to really kind of adhere to one creed, to one belief, one God, and if you believe something else, then you're kind of going against your faith in some way. And so here, Buddhism, these college classes are, are presented as a religion like others. So certainly it must be of the same class as all the other religions. And there must be, then you can have inter-religious dialogue, inter-religious conflict of all kinds. Um, but the Buddha said this interesting statement, when I teach what I teach, there's no controversy with others. There's no disputing with others. So what is that? What does he teach? Um, 
I've spent um, some time now translating an ancient book of teachings called the, it's a very unglamorous title called The Book of Eights. And it's a little bit like the Dhammapada in that it's a series of verses, about 200 verses. But what's unique about this particular collection is that it has the appearance of being a, a, the most ancient of uh, teachings of Buddhism. There's a very large body, like this big book I'm reading from, the Middle Dis Discourses. Uh, I read from the uh, Sutta 18 in here. Uh, this is just uh, maybe one, I don't know what, one-seventh of all the discourses of the Buddha as they're recorded. But this particular uh, uh, collection of 200 verses uh, appears to be the most ancient of all this, partly because the language is quite archaic, and partly because the content suggests that it's quite old, and partly because um, in this larger collection of texts, that all this big collection, um, it's one of the few texts which are referred to by name. So when this was, these were compiled, they knew about the other one and they referred to it by, by its name several times. So it's considered to be quite ancient, maybe the earliest of the Buddha's teachings. Now what's uh, also unique about this early text that I translated, the Book of Eights, is that um, if you gave it to a college student who took a college survey course of rural religions and they'd read the tenets and beliefs of Buddhism and, if, and, and actually had a professor who did this, handed this to their students, it was kind of a final exam, and asked, is this text Buddhist? And most of the, most of the college students say no. Because all the usual college textbook ideas of what Buddhism is do not appear in this text. So uh, there's no Four Noble Truths. There's no Eightfold Path. There's no emphasis on not-self, the great teachings of Anatta. There's no emphasis on emptiness, the great teachings of emptiness. There's no emphasis on rebirth. That's a, rebirth is important. If they talk about rebirth in this text, they're saying that a wise person should not concern themselves with this. There's no teachings about uh, four stages of awakening, the four stages of becoming liberated they have in this tradition. There's no discussion about the four jhanas, the four meditative absorptions or the eight. There's no discussion about the four foundations of mindfulness, which is what we practice here. So many things that are strongly associated, this is what Buddhism is about, is absent in this text. It is not mentioned. So one theory is that this Book of Eights uh, was composed maybe by the Buddha at very early in his teaching career. He taught for about 40 years. And before he started to systematize his teachings. When someone teaches 40 years, they begin to refine and systematize their, their teachings organize it, especially back in those days, uh, it had to be organized so that it could be passed on orally. There were no books to pass it on. And if you're going to pass on your teachings orally, you've got to systematize or organize it in such a way that it's relatively easy to memorize and hold in, in your mind. And so perhaps this text uh, dated from a time before the Buddha started to do that systematizing. That's one possibility. And another possibility is that some of the teachings now attributed to Buddhism maybe don't come, don't, aren't really uh, uh, from the Buddha after all. They were later additions to the whole tradition. It's, you know, it's hard to know. There's a lot of theories about this text because it's so unusual. This te text called the Book of Eights is sometimes considered to be very radical. Um, some people have said it's proto-Mahayana because it um, has elements in it like of later Mahayana philosophers like Nagarjuna or the Zen tradition. And in particular, because it emphasizes um, the importance of not having any views. That uh, to have a view is to miss the boat. So not having a view and not asserting something that it, it's controversial kind of go together. Because if you have nothing to assert, <laughs> then, you know, who are you going to argue with? So what kind of religious teachings can you champion 
if you have no views to go with it? Um, is an interesting question. So this book of eights um, <clears throat> has four major themes in it. The first major theme is the importance of not clinging to sensual pleasures, sensual desires. And it talks about a little bit about some of the dangers that can happen if you're addicted to sensuality. And I think the choice word is addicted because you probably, you know some people who are addicted to sensuality in a way that's probably not helpful for them at all. So it talks about the importance of not, that's one of the themes of this, this book of eights. The other theme is not to cling to views. And, um, bec and it's, it goes into some detail about how problematic it is to have views. Remember, it's a debate culture back there. And um, so, so it says here, um, so some of the problems with uh, clinging or holding on to views. If those views bring you peace, it is an unstable peace. Attachment to concepts and views leads to a person leads a person to swing between feelings, uh, feeling high and low, elated and depressed. That's especially like back in the, you're debated. You feel like now I have the truth and everyone believes it, or I'm champion of something, and you feel kind of great having the, the superior views. But then if somebody else comes in, uh, outsmarts you in a debate, and you realize that you, you didn't really have a sound argument, then you can get depressed. Debating others, one can become anxious for praise and bewildered when refuted. Frequently mentioned in the text is how clinging to views leads to quarrels with others. And uh, not a few Buddhists have ended up arguing with others, even though the Buddha never claims he never argued with anyone. You know. A considerable number of the verses are not only critical about such quarreling, but also of any judgment that one's own religious views are the truest or the best, while others are inferior. So the idea that you have views can go very clo can very quickly follow. I have the best views, the best teachings, the best whatever, and others are worse, and that ends into a lot of controversy. And it doesn't work very well at family parties. <laughs> so then it says, those who have realized the goal of the religious life the Buddha was teaching, uh, they re mostly refer to them as sages. And these sages are not attached to views. And so they avoid debates, quarrels, and any conceit that their own views are better than others. Having let go of attachments, they have no need for any doctrine and so do not oppose anyone else's doctrines. So that's the key to all this. Rather than views, and beliefs, the emphasis in the Buddha's, Buddha is not to cling. So if, you, if you're holding to hot coal in your hand, do you need a religious teaching to tell you to open your hand and drop the coal? Do you need a philosophy? Do you need a political party to tell you that? You know, you need to go to see a doctor, you know, uh, chances are, if you're holding that hot coal, you're going to be pretty quick to drop it. It's a pretty natural thing, because it hurts. If you are sensitive to the effect that clinging has to yourself, it'll be comparable to holding hot coal, because you realize that as you cling, you're going to hurt yourself. You're hurting yourself. Clinging is pain, is painful. And so if you can see it well enough, then uh, the movement to release yourself from pain, from clinging, um, is a natural movement. It might not be easy because there can be incredibly strong views, opinions, ideas, concepts of why it's important to cling. And those ideas can lead sometimes to be uh, terrified about letting go of something we're holding on to and clinging. Um, but the still, 
to cling itself hurts. I suppose that many people cling because they think that not clinging hurts more. If I don't hold on to my whatever. One of the interesting, challenging teachings of Buddhism is that perhaps all we ever cling to are ideas and concepts. I mean, unless you're sitting, standing at the edge of Half Dome, you know, and there's a railing there, you know, we, there's a physical grasping tight. But uh, that's not meant to be the same thing as psychological clinging to um, pleasure, clinging to views and opinions, our stories, clinging to identity and status and positions and, and um, clinging to relationships, clinging to our bank account, clinging to our homes. Oddly enough, even though we're clinging, we say we cling to sometimes to things themselves, in essence, we're really clinging to the concept and ideas that are behind those things. Even when we're clinging to relationships with people, there are physical people there, but you know, if you really pay, pay attention and study the mind deeply, you're really clinging to the concept and ideas you have of that person. And that becomes complicated, all these ideas. And so, big task, big part of what Buddhism is, Buddha was teaching was not a religion, religious view or a teaching about what is true, but rather this very, very simple thing of if you're clinging and it hurts, let go, open up your hand, open up your heart. And in fact, the Buddha explicitly said in this book of eights that um, to be concerned about ultimate truth is detracts from that work. If someone who wants to become free of clinging shouldn't be concerned about ultimate truth. Ultimate truth, however, is often a concern of religious people. But once you have the ultimate truth, it's very, looks very much like a view, an opinion, that you can have in contrast to other people's opinion. If all you have is non-clinging, you can go into any church, synagogue, temple, and you're not saying anything that's contradicting anybody. And if they say, this is the truth, you keep your hand open and walk, you know, walk in and out. You don't have to buy into it or do anything with it. You can say, oh, is that so? Is that so? That's interesting. Tell me more. That'd be, that's a respectful thing to do. Tell me more. But you don't have to, you know, it's not that what they believe, their concepts and ideas, and what they say is ultimate, the ultimate nature of reality in the universe. You know, hopefully, if you're a sage, you know better than to cling to it. Clinging also means resisting it. Just don't use, oh, is that so? So, cling, so the second theme of this um, Book of Eights is not clinging to views, but from this you see that actually the Buddha is talking about not clinging to anything at all. The third theme of the text is the nature of a sage. And here, another uh, common Buddhist idea that's absent in this text is that there's no mention of an arhat, that the goal is to become an arhat. Uh, uh, the arhat is a classic Buddhist way of talking about someone who's fully enlightened. But it refers, arhat literally means a worthy one. Someone's worthy of receiving alms, a monk, or worthy of respect because of their attainment. The, in, a, in a sense, the, the title for an enlightened person's early tradition, arhat, uh, the title refers to the relationship they have to other people. In this early text of Book of Eight, they don't use the word arhat. They use the word sage. That's the most common reference point for it. The second most common reference point, uh, kind of title or word for this ideal person is someone who's skillful, who has skill, who's proficient in something. So the sage is someone who's wise. And so here it's not, who the, who the, 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 the claim is not, the title that they refer to is, doesn't refer to their relationship to other people, but rather their relationship to themselves and that they're wise. Or skill, skillful, they're skillful themselves, it's their skill nothing to do about their status in relationship to other people. <clears throat> and so this early text uh, has a kind of radical spiritual individualism. Not that you're supposed to live a selfish life, <clears throat> but rather the, if the issue is clinging, 
who, who's going to release your clinging for you? Who's going to do that work for you? No one, you know, people can support you and, you know, comfort you and do different things that might help you finally to do the work you have to do. Just as much as someone can help you find the toilet when you have to pee. But, you know, you can get a lot of help about the direction to go. But, um, you know, <laughs> you know, we generally don't ask, ask people to come and help actually do it. Or ask, well, can you go do it for me? I'm busy. Can you go do it? You know, some things you can only do yourself. So, so that what the sage is called either a sage, someone who's wise, or it's called someone who's skillful, is the most common things. In the text, there's descriptions of who the sage, the qualities of someone who's a sage. And, um, and these are very interesting, the qualities of, you know, so if you become this ideal person, this person who's going to attain what the Buddha was talking about, what do you like? If you're not someone who's attained ultimate understanding of the universe, if you don't understand their, their ultimate religious truth, um, who are you? What kind of person are you? There's no mention in this text of transcendent experiences. So uh, there's no mention in this text of the classic textbook discussion of Buddhism, that Buddhism distinguishes between the conditioned realm and the unconditioned realm, between samsara, the realm of samsara and the realm of nirvana. There's no distinctions like that. Um, the only thing that's being referred to is here and now, this world. If people are concerned about future worlds or other worlds, they consider that say that's not really the domain or interest for someone who's a sage. It's all this world. So what is what are the qualities of a sage? A sage is someone. The most common description of the sage is someone who's peaceful, who's attained peace. And then there's all kinds of synonyms that are close words connected to that. The sage is someone who is um, tranquil, still and unmoving, unshakable, equanimous. Um, but even though a sage is peaceful, the sage does not depend on peace or intentionally pick peace up, intentionally take on peace. So this idea of not clinging goes so far as even this, a peace is kind of the most common description of the goal to become peaceful, but the sage does not depend on that peace. They're free, they're independent of even the goal here of this peace. Now, one of the advantages of the goal being peace is that it's not, again, a metaphysical goal. It's not some ultimately religious view about what you're supposed to attain that's apart from something simple that anybody can experience and know. Anybody can experience peace. Uh, you can experience a little bit of peace and you can experience dramatic peace. And uh, it can wash over you so it feels like every cell in your bone, in your body, uh, feels like it's become luminously clear and still. It feels like it's permeated with a stillness and clarity and coolness that, um, you know, maybe some people have the experience when they go into a great, sometimes the great cathedrals in Europe sometimes, or even, um, maybe in this country, you go in and there's kind of great peacefulness, or some places in nature, it feels so peaceful. Earlier, last week I was up um, on the bridgeway, it's called, in Sausalito. It's uh, on the bay up in northern, northern, San Francisco Bay, and it was a beautiful early morning. It was seven o'clock in the morning, and it was you'd look out, and there was almost no wind. There's no wind, I think, and the, the light and the stillness of the San Francisco Bay was so peaceful. I just felt so good inside, like I felt this quivering peace in my chest, looking out at the still water of the bay. So peace is something we can all experience. That's comparable to how we can all experience the pain of clinging. So it's something that's available to all of us. And it doesn't require having great peace to understand peace. A little bit of peace. I remember going home uh, to my young kid when he was, you know, two or three years old. He'd spent a day working and knowing what I was coming home to. So I would stop the car about 300 yards before the house <laughs> and, and turn off the engine for five minutes. 
and, you know, feel some peace before I walked through the front door and was handed the kid here. <laughs> Your turn. So, um, so the most common uh, description is that they're peaceful. Other descriptions, a sage does not depend on anything or take up anything. They have attained peace by letting go of arrogance, by letting go of attachments to possessions, by letting go of clinging, by letting go of desire for sensual pleasures, by letting go of sorrow. Does that, that, that make sense? Does that compute? Can you just let go of sorrow? Um, they let go of entanglements to doctrines, they let go of grasping, and they let go of conceit. They've abandoned illusion, shaken off every view, are unconcerned with sensual pleasures, have laid down their burden. Um, another description of the sage is a sage is, is a seer, who someone who sees and knows. So what can you see and know that wouldn't translate to a view or an opinion or a story about the universe or religious? What is it you can know and see? That's important. And this book of eights describes two things that this age can know and see. Um, first, the sage understands the various ways in which people struggle. They know what is non-harmonious. They know what is dangerous. They know what it is to be dependent. To be, um, they understand the nature of conventional opinions. They understand the nature of pride. They understand how people are selfish. They understand how people get elated and deflated in their disputes. They understand how people speak with arrogance and pride. And they understand how people cling to teachings. Having, un having insight, have understanding and being wise about these difficulties, how these things work, they become wise. So rather than pointing to some ultimate truth that they're supposed to see and understand, and take a philosophy class and try to understand the intricacies of complex religious philosophy, which people do. People get PhDs at Stanford to try to understand these things in Buddhist studies. And, uh, but uh, here, what's, what's important is to actually have insight to understand how people get in trouble. The, the hindrances, the difficulties, the ways people operate that cause suffering. It's seeing the human problem, how it operates. Um, now, this is beautiful, I think very important, because M Buddhism itself has a lot of ideals, the ideal being compassionate or concentrated or mindful or many things. And one of the most uh, significant ways of relating to an ideal is not to try to live up to the ideal so much, but rather to understand what interferes with the ideal. What gets in the way of you being compassionate? What gets in the way of you getting concentrated? And so that makes you wise about, you know, how you actually work, how the mind operates, uh, the difficulties you have. And you're not trying to override, do a spiritual bypass of how you are, but rather by understanding how you actually, your mind actually operates, the tricks of your mind, all these things, then you see it directly. So if you, see, if you, if you experience directly how painful it is to hot, hold the hot coal, you'll let go. If you experience directly the difficulties of holding on to conceit, how that's painful, then you're more likely to let go of it. But if you haven't seen the suffering of conceit, they can seem pretty good. It's probably true, mm -hmm. right? So, so part of the being wise is to understand the difficulties that of human, of human behavior and how it lives. Um, so that's the task. The second thing that the wise person sees and knows is peace itself. They uh, know and see the inner peace realized through not clinging. It's the seeing of this peace that can help a person know not to get into disputes. Being at peace and having overcome craving, sages become independent in the Dharma. And this is a very important term in Buddhism. The idea that we practice Buddhism to become independent in the Dharma, meaning that you no longer depend on anybody else's teachings, 
or with anybody else's help and support because you know the Dharma or you know the practice, you know what this is about so intimately for yourself. It does not mean studying a book on Buddhist philosophy and the intricacies of it, but it, under, it, it really has to do with understanding the psychological forces that come into play that cause people to suffer and the alternative to those forces, which is to become peaceful. And if you understand the value of that peace, <clears throat> the importance of it, or the uh, tremendous meaning, or not meaning, but the value of it, how satisfying it is, <clears throat> and how to cling to anything else isn't that satisfying? Clinging to all kinds of different kinds of hot coal, different temperatures and colors, is much less satisfying than letting go and having an open hand. And so if you understand the nature of, if you really see the peace, then you, can, you feel that's where, I'm, that's where I take my stand, that's where I rest, that's where I stay. I'm not going to get involved in the disputes. I don't care what other people argue and say and claim as ultimate reality. I don't need to know that, that was ultimately true. Um, so that's the second theme. There's three themes. themes. Not, don't, not clinging. First, have to, first two have to do with not clinging. Not clinging to sensual pleasures, not clinging to views. And then the descriptions of the qualities of the sage is a third theme of this book of eights. And the fourth is how to train yourself to become a sage. And how do you train yourself? Uh, there's a lot of things they say, a lot of things, a lot of, but uh, the, the most central thing they say about training is that uh, the, the, if the, the, the means should reflect, they don't say it this way, but the means should reflect the goal, or the goal should be reflected in the means. Meaning that if the goal is to be peaceful, you, you obtain peace by starting to be a peaceful person. If the goal is to be calm, you practice being calm. If the goal is to be generous, you start practicing generosity. Maybe you can't do it very well at first, but you know, it's not, we're not talking about something unattainable. We're not talking about something far in the distance that you know, we can maybe hope to you know, the, the great religious adepts who can spend years and years in the caves of the Himalayas, maybe they can attain something. We're talking about a gradual process of moving towards greater and greater experiences of peace or greater and greater calm or equanimity or wisdom or understanding. And if the idea is to be wise, we, we become wise by studying ourselves, studying how people cling and argue and get in trouble by their clinging. Um, so, does this give you some sense of why the Buddha could say, um, what I assert and proclaim, uh, how do you say it here, does not I assert and proclaim in such a way that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world. Does that make sense? No? You know why he might say that? So this teaching of not, at the heart of this is not clinging, experiencing peace. If this in fact is the earliest teachings of the Buddha, they don't contradict a lot of the later teachings. But what they do say is these later teachings of Buddhism and this the way that Buddhism is systematized in the teachings of the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and all the different things, what it, what it implies is don't pick them up as if they're just another view. That Don't pick them up as if they're another religious teachings to hold on to and to argue with other people, I have the right teachings finally. That's not their function. They're not their function to, you know, to believe, to read this, now I have to believe this. It's not meant to be a belief, like a creed. If these later teachings are continuing this early tradition, these later teachings are just a little bit more elaborate ways of saying the same thing. Pointing back to the same possibility, which is a very 
ordinary human thing that when you hurt, when you hold on to hot coal, you let go. When you let go, you experience the, uh, a more peaceful state. What makes Buddhism a religion is when you take this ordinary movement, ordinary everyday kind of thing, when you have a thorn, you pull the thorn out, and it's applied really thoroughly in the mind and the heart, in the depths, the fullness of what goes on in the mind and the heart. And if you understand the complexity and the depth and the subtlety with how the mind and heart works, and how much there is grasping in the mind in subtle, subtle ways that are profound, then you have a sense that the experience of non-clinging is such a thoroughgoing revolution and change. And the peace that it comes from that is so thorough and big, different, that the only thing you can relate to is that this is one of the most powerful religious experiences you can have, if you like such things, or to call it that. So um, we have five minutes for quarreling. <laughs> if anyone dares after that, I'd be very welcome of people who want to protest or try to offer a different view or argue. You know, I'm happy with that. I might not argue, I might not argue back. So here, to your left, there's the mic. Thank you. So I want to ask the difference between being attached to certain views and still letting them guide your actions. So there's right livelihood, right, you know, right speaking, all these things that become motivators for choices we make and things that we want to do or not do. How's that different from being attached? Uh, well, or, there can be a world, a, a world of difference being attached versus being guided. You know, many of us don't understand uh, so well how our minds work and what's really helpful and supportive for this process, this incredible process, a very profound process of letting go. And so sometimes it's, uh, it's, you know, if we have to reinvent the wheel by ourselves, it's kind of hard. So one of the things, for example, that, so, so what the Buddha said is that um, it's useful, uh, in other places, he said it's useful to get guidance from the wise people, those who are wise. And the wise people, uh, according to the wise Buddhist people, they'll tell you that it's not a good idea to uh, go kill people, or steal, or involve in sexual misconduct, or, or lie, or, or drink intoxicants. So if you want to, if you want to kind of move into this territory of non-clinging and peace, you should really avoid those things. So there's a series of, so there's guidelines of things that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so the Eightfold Path is part of that guideline. And so there has to be some trust and confidence that the wise people know what they're talking about. This is useful, but you have to keep in mind the whole purpose of this is to attain the peace of not clinging. And so that's your, that's your guideline and reference point for how you hold on to the Eightfold Path and how it, where it's moving you so you can test it and find out you're doing it the right way. I've known people who have taken on like the five precepts and they and everyone around them has suffered more because of it. <laughs> so, so, you know, almost any these Eightfold Path, any of these Buddhist doctrines, you know, if you get self-righteous and all kinds of problems can arise. So, but if you have the guideline always that you use your, uh, your, your mindfulness to notice, and it is helping me move to a person who's more peaceful, less clinging to things, then hopefully that becomes a corrective or a protection from how we pick up Buddhist doctrines. So Buddhism itself, you know, we, we, don't, we want to be very careful we don't cling to Buddhism. Because Buddhism is a religion, if it's a religion, that's supposed to help us be free of suffering. And it's very sad when people suffer because of Buddhism. <laughs> and people do, because it involves a practice. And as soon as you involve in a practice, you're trying to do something. And if you're trying to do something, even if some Buddhists try not, they're trying to do something, they're trying to do nothing. <laughs> so it can't, can't really get away from not trying to do something. And then, we bring, have, many of us have so much baggage connected to doing something. Success and failure come into play, 
identity issues come into play, expectations and striving or all kinds of things come into play. And so part of uh, walking the path is to learn uh, about how, what we do when we try to do the path and to recognize, and if you recognize how you suffer, if you recognize how you're clinging, uh, you'll learn the lessons a lot faster. But if you're not tuned into the importance of noticing clinging, grasping, addiction, compulsion, obsession, if you're not clued into that, clued into how to pay attention to your own suffering in a health, helpful way, then it takes a lot longer to learn the lessons. Does this uh, maybe address your question or do you want to ask something else or ask differently? Uh, well, I know we only have a minute left. I, I think it's just, you know, um, if you want to be active in the world, like, you know, there's injustice and you want to take a stand against it or, or you know, you're invited or called upon to do something that you don't believe in, you make that choice in part out of your, out of your views, right? I mean... Perhaps. So, or do you just say, gee, that person's getting murdered over there and I don't believe in murder, but I'm just going to, you know, not be attached to that. You know, or, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm sort of saying. Well, yeah, so, so the question is, um, to what degree do we act in the world based on views and opinions? And to what degree is, it, are, is there some way in which it's a natural response of the heart to respond to some things? You know, uh, I was coming here, maybe some of you came here, just, but just a few minutes before I drove down the street, there was an accident on uh, Hopkins. Probably some of the sirens we heard was the accident. And, um, and uh, it looked like, you know, the people were not getting out of the car so quickly. But there were a big crowd, of, not a big crowd, but there were people already there attending to it. It seemed like I, if I stopped, I'm not a doctor, it seemed like there was lots of people doing it. I wasn't needed, it was probably better just not to keep going. But um, it felt like completely natural for me to drive by slowly and carefully to see if I was needed. And if I was the only one there, I would have gotten them out of my car and helped. But that's not because I have a philosophy that teaches me not to do that. You know, you're, if your baby is crying and hungry, the mother doesn't look up in a manual, unless you were back in the 1920s when, <laughs> you know, they had these manuals that back then that they, caused so much suffering. Some of you maybe who grew up then in that era suffered from those manuals. But I think the natural thing is to, you know, if your baby cries because the baby's hungry, so you feed it. You don't need a philosophy to teach you that. So if someone's being murdered, I mean, I remember, I remember uh, when I was at um, San Francisco Zen Center, uh, back when I was there, it was a dangerous neighborhood. And uh, people were getting mugged and shot and robbed and killed in that neighborhood. And uh, we would do our morning meditation in the, in the f bottom floor. And, you know, five o'clock in the morning, we're meditating there, a room full of 50 Zen students. And occasionally we'd hear uh, cars being broken into. We'd hear prostitutes with their customers in the alley behind the building. We would hear people being mugged and calling for help. And if if it seemed like it needed, needed help, it was quite impressive. You'd hear the first cry of help, you'd have 50 Zen students pounce out of their chairs <laughs> and out the side door, running out the street to help. No hesitation. So I hope that, um, what I hope is that this practice of learning not to cling, learning to pay attention, releases the natural caring and compassion of how we care for each other um, and so if you see someone being killed, you hopefully have the wisdom to know what's the best thing to do at that point. Um, but it isn't because of philosophy. Now, what about people getting killed in countries far away from here? Um, is it any different? Then you have issues of national policy and other things come into play. But I do wonder whether, um, you know, so, there, so then we have all kinds of political views of what's needed and all that. But is it possible to have political views that start with a very simple foundation, the foundation of suffering and freedom from suffering. I don't know. So this teaching in this text called the Book of Eights, the Pali word is Atagavaga. It's found in a larger collection called the Sutta Nipata. And it's one of the canonical texts of the early Buddhism. 
And uh, it's considered to be very, but many people, scholars and people who, read, who study this text, it's considered very radical, radical teaching. And um, so it can, you know, maybe I've presented it kind of simplistically, I don't know, but, um, but perhaps if you uh, hear that it's meant to be radical, you will uh, t take it home with you and engage with it and take it seriously, this kind of approach. And may you have a approach to the religious life that doesn't lead you to quarrel with anybody. Thank you. <laughs>